Welcome. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to get in and you're working our way through it. Let's pray and then we'll dig right in. Thank you, dear Lord, for what you've given. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that's here. Help us to grab a hold of what you have written for us so that we might grow by it. Let our hearts be open to whatever the Holy Spirit would teach and lead us to. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty. What we're going to do is summarize slightly, and then we're going to jump right in here in verses 29 through 33. But listen to what we have to say first. Paul began by summarizing the gospel. Verses 3 and 4, he told that it contained the message that Jesus Christ had died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Then he supported the gospel by letting us know again about the word of God. This is according to the scriptures, this happened, and the eyewitness reports of those who met Jesus when he rose from the dead. Third, he strengthened the gospel by questioning those who said there was no resurrection from the dead and explaining to them, are you kidding me? What on earth do you think the ramifications of denying that would be? And then fourthly, he supplemented the gospel by telling us what has gone on since. In that, verses 20 through 28, he talks about everything brought, being brought together and wrapped up in the, in the Father. But it included the resurrection of the dead, Jesus as the first fruits. Now, in verse 29 through 33, it says this. He's just gotten through saying, when all things have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all, so that the Father contains everything. Otherwise, Paul says, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And let me admit to you that as I read through here and I get to that section, I wonder, what on earth is going on? And it turns out that this is some of the toughest Stuff to understand in the word. Verse 29. Otherwise, he says, What will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are they baptized for them? So here's a question. How are we supposed to understand this? Some in Paul's day had apparently begun the practice of being baptized in proxy for someone who had already passed away. The departed. They were concerned about their eternity, and so they thought we can be baptized in their stead. But there is no scriptural instruction for being baptized for another, whether dead or alive. There is nowhere that we're taught that someone can believe for someone else or someone can be baptized for someone else. It's not in the Word. What Paul is saying here is that there were those who were doing this and they did so because of their hope in the resurrection. And that's his point here. If the dead are not raised, why are they baptized for them? What he's saying is, the reason they're doing that is because they are firmly convinced in the resurrection. And so in preparation for that, they are being baptized for those who have already passed away. This is not an endorsement for that practice. As a matter of fact, um, you'll notice that as Paul writes about it, he said, Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised, then why are they baptized for them? He says, it's not something we're doing, but some are doing it. And so what he was saying simply is that more evidence for faith in the resurrection is demonstrated by those people, but it doesn't mean that that is a practice which we should do. We understand that some... Uh, some religious groups do be baptized for the dead. The word of God does not teach that, nor say that we should be doing it, nor that it is a, is a practice that accomplishes anything. It only mentions it here, and it's Paul using what some were doing 
to back up what he's been saying. The resurrection of the dead is key to the whole gospel. Then he goes on to his next argument. Remember that his whole purpose here is to say, why is the resurrection of the dead important? What is it that we're holding on to? Why is this something that we need to emphasize? Why are those who are baptized for the dead? Why do they do it? Because they have hope in the resurrection. Then he says, why are we also in danger every hour? And Paul gets real. The fact is, the reality of believing and being vocal about the resurrection and the whole cost of the gospel of Jesus Messiah is costly. When Paul wrote, the threat of arrest, of punishment, even of death was a very real thing. If you look back at Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 23, it says, and I'm only only pointing this out, this was when they were leaving Ephesus. From Miletus we went to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. This is when Paul is traveling back towards Jerusalem. And when they had come to him, he said to him, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And he knows from God that this is what's in his future. And instead of hesitating and holding back, he goes after it. He says, I'm following the Lord, even if that's what comes out of it. If you look at 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 27, here in the next letter that he's going to write to the Corinthian church, he's going to tell them the things that he's been through. And you read about beatings and shipwreck and and horrible abuse. Spending time in jail, spending time in chains. Um, And and he says, I've already experienced all those things. When Paul talked about the fact that his suffering, why am I also in danger every hour? It's because that made up his life. Paul, in fact, assures him in verse 31, they are his boast. What does he have as evidence for the effectiveness and the good of his word? Verse 31 says, I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, you're my boast. I don't have to boast in words. You're the evidence that the gospel is effective. And as he goes on, he says that he lives with the knowledge that he could die every day. He says, you, brethren, By the boasting in you that I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. What he says is, the threat of death hangs over me all the time. Could you say that cheerfully? If you thought that there literally was a threat of death in your life every day, how would you hold up under that? He's assuring them that it's not pride he gets from staying faithful to preaching or or of the accolades or the, the praise that he gets. It's they themselves who are the who are the, the boast, the the pride, the joy that he has from what he's doing. Verse thirty two says, If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. What do you think Paul is saying when he said, why did I go through all this in Ephesus? Well, let's look at it a little bit. In Acts chapter 19, I'm just going to summarize, but Acts chapter 19 tells about Paul at Ephesus. At one point, a businessman named Demetrius, who had made a living by selling silver icons and silver tokens for the worship of his goddess, Artemis, realized that this Christianity Paul was spreading was cutting into his bottom line. He said, if this keeps up, people are going to quit buying our stuff altogether. So he got some others who were of the same trade, and they got all excited. And more people came because it looked like something big was going on. And in a little while, they had formed a first-class riot. And they were shouting, and they were... They, most people, in verse 32, it says most of the people at the, at the meeting didn't even 
uh, <laughs> didn't even know what they were there for. This is Acts 19 and 32. It became a huge hullabaloo, and Paul wanted to enter the arena where the uproar was taking place. They were shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians, or Artemis of the Ephesians. And as, as they were shouting this, Paul says, let me go in there. And they said, no, the disciples wouldn't let him go. And then some of the city leaders said, make sure he doesn't come in here. Well, it was such a wild uproar, and it must have sounded like the roar of beasts as they were shouting and and the 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 vehemence in which they they talked in back in first corinthians fifteen thirty two it, it says if from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus well in titus one twelve Paul quotes someone who refers to the people of Crete as evil beasts, the very same word. So what it would appear was that he was in Ephesus, it was like he was thrown into the arena. Now, as a Roman citizen, he would not have been thrown into an actual arena, but the arena of their influence, the things that were going on, the hostility, was like dealing with wild beasts. And consider some of the things Paul went through for the gospel. In Acts chapter 14, and uh, verse 19 to 20, it says that they stoned him. He took place in the stoning as a recipient. What's really interesting is in the book of Acts, it tells us that when they stoned Stephen, the martyr to death, they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who is the Paul who is writing 1 Corinthians. But here in Acts chapter 14, Stoning was a fairly inexpensive and quite effective way to kill someone. If you wanted to eliminate them, you pummel and beat them to death with rocks. And, and once you're sure they're dead, they did what, what the people at Ephesus did. They drug him out of the city, left him outside, not even a decent burial, left him there. The disciples were standing around looking at him and feeling horrible. And suddenly, all at once, Paul stood up. And they walked back into town. And the very next day, it says that Paul and Barnabas set out for the next city. This was a huge miracle. Someone who had been traumatically beaten with stones till they were left for dead should have been laid up for weeks. Paul walked to the next town. He wasn't being put off. This made me think of something, and this isn't. This isn't real spiritual. But I've never participated in a stoning. But I once accidentally participated in a wall knitting. <laughs> My friend and I were in our little logging town that I grew up in, and we were going somewhere, and I realized I needed to get home. My mom had told us to come, me to come home, and so I told him I was leaving, and he didn't want me to. And finally, he whacked me on the arm, and he took off running. And so as he was running away, I was looking, I thought, I need to throw something at him and scare him. So I looked down, and in the mud was a black walnut. Now, black walnuts are big and hard. This one had been soaking for a while, so it, was, it had some heft to it. And so I looked at him running. Now, right here, time slows down. I can still picture in my mind exactly what happened. I threw back and threw that thing, and it went sailing in a great arc. And it went up, and it started coming down. And I was watching, and it was like watching a cartoon. He was still running all this time, and this has been... This has been a bit of time, and he's quite a ways out, but it had a good arm. And as he was running, that walnut came down and went, put right on the top of his head, right square on the top. And when it hit the top of his head, it bounced high as the trees, and he fell down. I thought, oh, no. And I went running up there to see what was going on. He was laying on the ground, holding his head, going, oh. I said, sorry, and then I ran home. I was still going to be late. Anyway, that doesn't add to our story much. What I'm saying is, Paul was actually stoned and left for dead to the point where they were convinced he was dead. His disciples, his, his, the disciples he talked to thought he was dead. He got up and God brought him. Some have supposed that he was dead and that God raised him up because he wasn't done with his work yet. Maybe. But back in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 32, Paul effectively says, you think I've got some sick human motives for things I went through just in Ephesus alone? If there's no resurrection, we may as well stop with the grief, take it easy, and just indulge ourselves till we die. Let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's actually a quote 
from Isaiah chapter 22, verse 12 and 13, where God calls his people to mourn and repent. Instead, they rejected God's call, put on a barbecue with an attitude that they'd pig out because they may as well, they might die tomorrow. Is that the attitude we should have? Paul says, is that the attitude you think I should have? And then Paul makes, he wedges something in here that for a long time I wonder, why? He said, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. It's verse 33. Don't let anyone fool you. And what he's doing, he's referring back to these people who are part of the church who are denying that the resurrection ever happened. And what he's saying is these guys are feeding lies into your fellowship. They lie that the resurrection didn't happen. Bad company corrupts good morals. To harbor and keep someone who's undermining the faith, who's denying the very center point of the faith in Jesus Christ is dangerous. It could affect them all. I thought of an example. See, you see someone who's baking bread. So they've up on the up on the counter, they're punching and, and mixing their bread, and they've got it most of the way done, and they accidentally slip and they knock it off on the floor. And they pick it up off the floor, and they look at it, and they say, well, there's a little hair in it, maybe a little sand, a couple of things I don't identify, but ah, it'll be good. And they roll it up and go ahead, and they, how would you feel about eating one of those rolls when it came time for dinner? I think that's nasty. And what Paul said is, don't you understand what, what violates, what makes filthy spreads? You can't have a little bit of filth and think things are fine. Bad company corrupts good morals. You can have the best intentions, but someone undermining the very heart of your message, you can't have that. It's not okay. It's important to understand the danger that is there. The Word of God, in its wisdom, teaches very, very carefully that we avoid being hooked up with and joined together with someone who doesn't share the commitment and the, the salvation that we experience. In the Old Testament, Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Scoffers means mockers, somebody who laughs and belittles what's true and right, what belittles God's word. It says we don't walk where they walk. We don't stand where they hang out. We don't sit down and give them the time to blaspheme and pay, make fun of this gospel of Jesus Christ. It's important. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 14 to 18 says this. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. The word bound together is, here is a farming term. It means do not be yoked together. When they used to take a set of two oxen, they would put yokes on their necks and hook them up so that both of them pulled as a team. Now, if you have a team and they're hooked together, they're to be going in the same direction. They're supposed to be going for the same goal. You want nice straight furrows when you're plowing a field. But if you have the two oxen fighting each other, if one wants to go ahead but the other one wants to go off across the field, how much work do you think will get done? And what's wrong is that both of those don't have the same focus, the same direction. They're not going to end up in the same place. Do not be bound together. Don't be yoked up with. Don't be harnessed together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light and darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? The word Belial <clears throat> is a word that literally means without profit or worthless, and another name for Satan, our adversary. And so he says the two opposite, Christ and Satan, our adversary, our enemy. He said, do they have anything in common? He said, no. Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Nothing. Not in your life goals, 
not in what you desire to accomplish in growing in the Lord, not in your desire to share the good news of Jesus? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God says. How are we that temple? God lives in us. His Holy Spirit inhabits us. We are the temple of God. For we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. And I'll be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. The word makes clear. Be careful who you hang with. Be careful who you listen to. Who has... Who, who speaks and you listen? Who do you pay attention to? Who is it important for you to hear and decide and listen and make up your mind? Be warned. Don't be afraid to be drif different. Don't put yourself in connection with people who undermine your faith walk with God. Eternal life hangs in a balance. It's vitally important that you have discernment, and he's telling the Corinthian people here, really? Don't you understand that bad company corrupts good morals? Do you realize that these people undermining the very gospel that saved you are a problem? They can undermine, they can chip it away, they can take your foundation, they can make it so that your witness and testimony of the gospel has, is, is ineffective. Therefore, be careful. So, he says, let's summarize what we've talked about. There were some who were baptized for the dead. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. He said, they show that their hope is in the resurrection. They believe it's a true deal. It's a done deal. And he says, and what about us? What about the danger that we live in all the time? I've gone through terrible things. The threat of death hangs over me. You think I'd keep doing that from some human motive? If that was all there was to it, I might as well give up, get ready to enjoy my last years, and then die. And then he says, don't be deceived. He says, maybe it sounds funny what I said, but don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good moral. Who are you listening to? Who's the one telling you what's important to know? Who is witnessing to you the truth of what's so. Who are you accepting as the ones with the truth in their mouths as they speak to you? Be warned. Be careful. We live in a time when a lot of people are awful vocal. They're saying a lot of things. Who are you listening to? Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for your word. But sometimes your truths are pretty hard. Help us to understand. When we listen to someone, we give them a say in our lives. We need to be extremely careful that we do not harbor untruths that tear apart the gospel that is our faith and trust that gives us our eternal life. Help us to have wisdom. Help us to be able to see and choose and spend time with what builds us up, what causes us to be healthy, whole, and strong in the Lord. Thank you. We love and praise you and ask you to guide us in it. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. We'll go on from here next time. This is uh, some good stuff. And he's getting so practical. He's talking about how do you put this faith into practice in your lives? Who you hang out with? Your motivation? Why do you do what you do, even when some people don't understand and, and treat you bad for it? These are the things that he's dealing with. We'll go on from there next time. I hope you join us and we'll continue. God's good. His word is good. Keep at it. See you next time.